All right, thanks for staying with us. Now, building skills that transcend geographical location has become increasingly crucial in our interconnected world by focusing on communication, digital literacy, adaptability, problem solving, and continuous learning. Individuals can position themselves to thrive in various settings and seize opportunities beyond physical boundaries. So today we're asking, how can we build skills um, irrespective of our geographical location um, that's the conversation for today. Now, please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081-803-4663. Um, you can also tweet at us at Weisho Africa 1. Uti, in a minute, do you have any skill that you have learned like that, can, that you can literally sit in Nigeria and work from anywhere in the world? Hmm. Or work with any company in the world? Well, the I think the work that I do in customer experience can really be done anywhere in the world because it's a strategic role. So um, I think that, that can be done anywhere in the world. Uh, off the top of my head, I mean, if we're talking about the more technical side of the skills, I don't think that I have anything. But if I take my superpowers in the, in the realm of organization, mm -hmm. communication, the ability to touch type, all of those kind of things. I probably would be able to be a virtual, an, an excellent virtual assistant. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not a techie. I'm not playing in tech space so at so be, all. It would be nice for us to hear from the guests what kind of opportunities would be there yeah, available. You know, for. Right, I mean, the only reason why I'm sitting in this chair today is because <laughs> I want to learn how to earn dollars. Right? Sorry, right from my seat here in Nigeria. <laughs> because there's no better place to my learn money. That's that I would like, like to important. earn. <laughs> Um, in dollars, yeah. I like to earn in forex. <laughs> any anyone, as long as it's foreign currency. All right, so Chuka has a career spanning almost two decades as a technopreneur, a software architect, engineer, speaker, and author. It has led to um, it has led medium to large size teams and delivered multi sized software engineering projects for different industries across Africa, North America, Europe, and um, he is the founder of Studiopedia, a production company leveraging technology to help educators and creative um, creatives rather produce and distribute digital content globally. He is also the founder of Interstellar Labs, a company that builds developers' um, experiences using blockchain technology, and um, he's also the author of New Newbie to Techie. He is an angel investor in tech, one of um, 35 Google developer experts from Africa, and a mentor in the Google for Startups program. And he's joined us live from somewhere around the world. I'm not sure where now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chika, for joining us this evening. <laughs> it's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> okay, so this conversation around tech, you see, Uti is very, my ears are very like, like we're standing because I really mm -hmm. want to understand, uh, because I, on, okay, so on Wednesday we had had a guest that was talking about how they are using AI to influence mm -hmm. learning in Nigeria and already Lagos State and Borno State mm -hmm. governments have adapted those um, um, solutions in the classrooms. So now students can go up in the cloud and they can do a lot of things. And with the advent of 5G, for instance, they can then start to think of bringing, for if we have Uti, she's the best communications teacher in the world. Mm -hmm. We can just teleport Uti to all the classrooms across Nigeria. She doesn't have to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there was a fear about teachers losing their jobs and all of that. I know you would address that. But really, um, are there really opportunities in the tech world, you know, um, that can truly change the narrative when it comes to economic power. Because one of the biggest problems I think we have mm -hmm. as young people in Nigeria, we do not have um, skills that can earn us good income, right? So that's why a lot of things are, we're still struggling with a lot of things in this country. So are there truly opportunities in the tech world that can transform our economy? Absolutely, absolutely. The opportunities are tremendous. They're very mass they're massive. I'd say this, right, given where technology is today and where we are going in the world, um, technology is becoming the new oil, or it is actually now the new oil. And I'm not saying this as a Nigerian who sits somewhere around the world, like you mentioned, but I'm saying this because if you take a step back 
and you see how other countries are leveraging technology and you see how um, all the advancements that are happening in technology you talked about ai you talked about you know you know smart computing you talk about cloud computing all these things are things that are not going to slow down it's just going to keep evolving so as technology is evolving so are the people who will support it need to evolve right and because it's now becoming mainstream if you take away if you look back in the early 1920s and the early 1850s you do know that oil was was what was the main thing, oil and transportation via rail. These are the mediums that people will then say, okay, because of those roles, people would want to grow up to either become mechanics or engineers or a hey, oil drillers, right? Um, I remember when I was much younger, if you didn't want to be one of the five uh, roles, then it means that you didn't have a future doctor, lawyer, lawyer so on and so forth. Engineer. You know, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Accountant. But the narrative, has, the narrative has changed and it has changed because times have changed. Mm. We've gone into the, you know, tech age when the technology era and i think because of that many opportunities are going to open up the question then is how do you fit into these these opportunities how do you take advantage how do you find them and how do you take advantage of them mm. yeah. all right so uti i'll come to you but let me just quickly give something that i found you know when you talked on the platform right first you said there's a global demand for tech skills second you said um the advent of ai you know will not take people's jobs i want you to explain <laughs> yeah. that then you said by 2025 that's very short 2025 is just two years from now oh, that 97 million jobs will be created by tech and you then went on to say 133 million jobs you know um would would come as a result of ai expansion i don't understand like first of all 2025 <laughs> is just two two years from now how can 97 million jobs and we're complaining of unemployment in this country. Well, so so I hear you, and I think I'm just going to piggyback okay. on what the numbers Uwa has just said. Um, in the last year, 18 months, maybe even two years, we've had a mass, mass... Brain um, drain. Not even brain drain. We've had mass reduction of numbers in the tech world. So face everybody, like literally... Um, I mean, Elon Musk was the devil maybe last year. <laughs> And then we came into 23, 2023, and other people are doing it. So I found these numbers really, really interesting. But in the face of that, I really want to hear, you know, how you're working these numbers and what kind of roles, uh, because, I mean, this yeah, is the tech yeah. world that has literally been shedding people like skin. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what, what would your, I, I just, I found the numbers intriguing. So really love to hear what you have to say about them. Yeah. So, you know, if you, if, you, if you go back to my speech, what I was talking about, first of all, these numbers are estimates, right? These are estimates based on the evolution of technology. Technology is not going to stop evolving, irrespective of the economic conditions that the world is facing. A lot of what is happening with the layoffs have to do with the economic conditions, right? Inflation rates going up around the world, cost of living going up, earning capacity reducing. So that's what's causing the squeeze that you're seeing now. Not that technology in itself is going to stop progressing, right? It will still keep progressing. The bright minds are still going to keep creating value. Now, what I was getting at there was that, you know, value would always, would always be something that will be created. And as long as value is created, people need to support that value, right? Not just in technology, even in other roles, but because a lot of people are now embracing and adopting technology as like the main stake for how they think about their company or how they think about their business or how they think about solving solutions or solving problems rather, that in itself is what is going to cause the expansion. Now, to quickly address the point around AI taking people's jobs, right? Here's my own, this is, this is my thesis, right? I feel, you know, the way with the advent of AI, just like with the advent of any new tool or the, any new, um, you know, technology, there's always the fear that, oh, well, this thing is going to replace humans. But that's not true. I feel like this will enable humans. So, which means it will create more opportunities for users to take advantage of the technology, right? Not replace them. I'll give you an example, right? They used to, we used to assemble cars by hand back, you know, at least 50, 80, 100 years ago. But today we have robot factories and those robot factories have not replaced jobs. Those robot factories still need humans to configure them, keep them running, make sure that automation works, do inspection. So just because replacement is coming in one angle where humans don't have to stress to do that work, it still will create the opportunity for other um, areas that the void that the, the, the AI technology would sort of fill, just like in the robotics case. So I'm saying what my own theory is, yes, 
AI may make some jobs obsolete. I'm not saying it will replace jobs. It may make some jobs obsolete. However, because those jobs are obsolete and because of the advent of AI, new opportunities will, will come along. You understand? It's like closing out one road, but new roads are going to be open. This is my own theory, and I believe it so strongly. Now, um, I don't think there's some things I don't think AI would really ever take away, right? For example, uh, AI will never, I don't think we'll ever get to the point. Well, this is me in 2023. I don't know about 2033 or 2043, <laughs> but I don't think AI would ever get to the point where it would take care of our children or nanny our children. No, right? it's not going to be possible. Ex ex exactly. There's still some fundamental things that mm. humans will still be responsible for. AI will never replace emotional judgment. AI will never replace, well, Never is a strong word, but I don't think we will get to a point where AI will replace emotional judgment and so on and so forth. All these things can still be calculated and rationalized, but I don't think it will ever replace it. And as long as that keeps happening, there will still be existence of jobs. Now, that's one thing. There's other parts to tech that people keep, uh, what's the word, ignoring. You don't necessarily have to be a tech person to work in technology. You don't have to be a coder or an engineer mm. to work in technology, right? I heard what um, Oti was talking about earlier as respect to customer experience. That's a legit role in tech. When people build solutions, they need to support their customers when their customers are not happy. Guess who are the people that will do it? Yourself. Exactly, the customer <laughs> experience people. When you think about business uh, strategy and when you're thinking about growing a company, okay, so I built a solution that uses technology to solve one problem, but I want to scale it across the world. Guess who's going to do it? Somebody who's going to do growth hacking for your company. That is a role working in technology without being a techno person, a, a, tech, yeah. a, a, a techie, let me, let me use that word. So, and there are many, many instances of it. People need to do product marketing. People need to do product management. People need to do, um, you know, uh, content development. They need to do sales. They need to. There's so many roles that will keep evolving just by virtue of people who are creating value by building companies. Mm. And as long as that keeps happening, unless you are saying the world is going to stop building companies and the world is going to stop solving problems, and that is what I'm saying is not going to change. That is always going to be a constant this decade, next decade, and so on and so forth. Mm. Mm. I like that you talked about creating value, right? Because that really is what this is all about. You, you're, you're creating or you're taking something new um, and you're able to ascribe value to it that somebody else is, you know, sees as well and is able to take advantage of it. Um, let's talk about crossing borders and the challenges that we have here in Nigeria. So, I mean, if I, if I take a certain part of Lagos that comes to mind, which is probably the equivalent of our own Silicon Valley, um, and all the different hubs we have in Yaba. It's still a, a very small microcosm. I know we have some other places that I'm aware of in, um, around the country, but given the amount of youth that we have um, and the challenges that we have with unemployment here and education, I love what you're doing with Studiopedia, but how many people are you truly reaching what, is your, what are your thoughts around scalability? How can we really get on board? I mean, Uwa mentioned only two states, right? Um, and they're 36? Yes, mm -hmm. they're 36. Plus, um, the, Federal Capital plus the FCT, right? Um, why are we not seeing more of this sort of key shift to being able to... Because these are people who are essentially going to bolster the economy, right? If you can, if you can, um, if you can transcend geographical restrictions without having to leave your current location. Whatever money you're earning is coming into this economy, right? So what are your thoughts there around, one, why we're not scaling? Um, two, I mean, really, what, what's the way forward where we can really embrace this as a country? Because we have real problems. We have, for a, our, good we have a huge youth population deficit, yeah. and, a, and very, very poor youthful, unemployment, oh, I say, population. very poor unemployment numbers. Absolutely. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'll, I'll I'll take a step back. I'll take it a step back. Right. Um, take a look at India. OK. India, in my own opinion, um, is probably the biggest exporter of tech talent in the world today. Uh -huh. OK. Um, and they are maybe 3x or 4x our size, right? But they're able to put themselves on the map, not just in terms of exporting talents that actually physically emigrate out, mm -hmm. but also exporting skills that with the, you know, with the talent staying back home in their country. And they're earning, you know, in the currency that they want to earn. So that they're, they're at the forefront of where Nigeria should be at, in my own opinion, or should surpass. 
So, but to, t to answer your question, it starts with literacy, like it starts with not just digital literacy, but access to the internet, right? The first thing is if you have access to the internet, the internet in my own opinion is a free university. A lot of, using me as an example, what I've learned today is me just going into these and teaching myself, right? I didn't go through a formal body of formal education or so on and so forth, just like in India, right? So I'm saying if we are able to solve internet connectivity problems around the country, mm -hmm. you would have solved like, 30% of the issue, because now connectivity is no longer a problem, because content is now where there's access to. And once we have our youth have access to this content, they can upskill themselves and then export themselves. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I think it's already happening. It's just happening at a much slower rate than anticipated. Mm -hmm. And I don't think India got to where they got to in one day. It did take, a, a, you know, it, it took years right? They started by outsourcing to themselves internally within their own country. Then they started outsourcing externally, right? I think right now we need to get to the point where even we are even hiring our own talent. But the problem is there's not enough of the good talent here to hire because all of them, you know, are exporting their talent uh, externally. So what am I saying in essence? For us to be able to rapidly get there, because it's already happening. So I don't want to discount that it's already happening. We have the CC Hub, which is a, you know, a cluster in, in Yaba. We have um, um, Techno Park. That, I can stay here and start to list different hubs and in different tech clusters, right? That is already encouraging and promoting self-education and so on and so forth. We also have schools who are helping people. Uh, you know, I talked about this at the platform. We talked about Decacon. We talked about old school. We talked about, um, you know, um, you know, university. These are these are companies that are helping people to get into tech. But how can we do it in in mass? Well, we will need to partner with, you know, the government. We will need to partner with the institution, private institutions. These people have the kind of funding, resourcing to be able to do it at scale. We need to partner with the educational bodies that we have existing today. I remember a project that um, the CCO of Anna and two other stakeholders were thinking about doing that. What's the best way to accelerate tech, um, not just tech adoption, actually, but tech self-learning, digital skills uh, and digital literacy and, you know, just teaching yourself things that would give you, uh, make you valuable in the tech ecosystem. And we're like, the easiest way is education. It's like, you know, using the formal, like, educational route, right? Partner with universities, both public and private. Those kinds of partnerships, creating programs, and not just creating programs, to be honest, actually putting it as part of curricula, all the way down to primary school, right? Giving students the skill set from primary school to secondary to university. The minute we change our orientation, change our curricula, we will see the dividends of this in, let's say, five years, because you have to put the investment down, right? It's not something that will happen overnight. But if we have the kind of policies that, en that enforce technology learnings for upskilling individually in our educational system from the ground all the way to tertiary, I'm telling you that by the time we're coming out the gates in like five years, we won't be creating a hundred, you know, maybe a thousand or two thousand uh, graduates who have skill sets that they can export globally. We'll be creating millions of students, hmm. millions and hundreds of millions of students. So that is the way, because we have educational bodies. You go to, you know, Sokoto, there should be a university or a polytechnic there or somewhere close by. You go to Lagos, same thing, go to Calabar, the same thing. So at least our educational bodies are still there. And they're still operating. Why don't we just partner with them, partner with education, whether it's the Ministry of Education, whoever it is that needs to be partnered with, we partner with them, bring curricula in so that we can do mass and you know mass uh, training and mass upskilling. And then we'll see the dividends in about four or five years as they start to grow. Absolutely. All right, so on that note, let's go on a very short break. When we come back from that break, we'll take this conversation further. I'm so I'm sure some people are itching to know. What can I just learn now? <laughs> Stay with us. We'll be right back. All right. Thanks for staying with us. Now, if you just tuned in, we're discussing building skills that transcend geographical location. And we have with us Chuka Ophili. And remember, you can join this conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 08 You can also tweet at us at Wayshow Africa one with the hashtag Wayshow. All right, so I mean, this conversation is really, really interesting. And I love what you said about Uti's skill, because let's use her as our, our guinea pig, <laughs> our lab rats, right? So, I mean, there are people out there right now, they have this kind of skills that they've built over the years, 14 years, 
maybe in a company working as a marketer and all of that. And they're thinking, okay, how do I upscale or how do I, you know, start to think borderless? How do I start to um, plan my life in a way that, you know, especially with the harsh economic realities that we have, right? So, I mean, what would be the quickest way, right, to start to think of digitalizing your skill and like converting it into something that, you know, you are not just, uh, you're not limited or restricted by your current geographical location, that you can now start to earn income from across any part of the world mm. Mm. dollars right the green back. <laughs> <laughs> you said so, it <laughs> uh so yeah so if you're i mean let's let's break it into two into two categories right we have the technical skills and the non-technical skills mm -hmm. the stereotype before now has always been you need to be you know learn some technical skill to earn in foreign currency and while that may be true that you can far out end most other um, roles in technology but there's still the non-technical ones right cx is one of them now which one is the easiest path well it all depends on you it depends on your personality type it depends on what you like to do or what you already know how to do day to day, right? If, for example, you're someone, and, and this is a hypothetical example, if you're someone who is, let's say, a, uh, you know, project manager for a for construction, okay, um, what do you do daily? You you go to sites, you you make sure that, you know, the, the, the bricklayers are there, you make sure that the engineers are there, like, you're, you're sort of like the foreman who makes sure that things happen on a day to day you if you don't see one of your resources or your artisan you call them where are you what's the follow up or what's the status of this and so on and so forth but you're the project manager right and then the real owner of the project reaches out to you or the owner of the building reaches out to you and you give them updates and then the updates you're giving them is basically information based on the fact that you're on site and you extracted all the information from your all your artisan that is what a scrum master does Right, mm. and a scrum master is a role that just works with first of all, organizes and plans the sprints, organizes and plans the cadence for the work that is actually done. The person doesn't actually do the work, but the person extracts the information, keeps all stakeholders aligned, keeps all stakeholders informed, and makes sure that the team is running in a healthy, efficient manner. That is the same thing as what a project manager does now. To transition, all you'd have to do would be look for some. Uh, program online, you know, there's many of them, Udemy, Udacity, and so on and so forth, do a short three-month course or short two-week course or what have you, depending on the kind of, uh, you know, role you want to transition in. Once you take that, all right, you now have the skill set. So once you have the skill sets, the next difficulty will be, okay, how do I actually get paid for the skill set? How do I find my first role, right? Well, there's many ways. You can find ways to intern locally, give your skills for free. And then when you're doing it for free, you, you know, you get experience. And when you get experience, you get on your CV. And then now you can actually look for remote jobs. And there are sites that you can go to, right? Remote.com and so on and so forth. There's so many of them online where you can actually go and look for remote work and take applications. You might not get the first one, but if you keep applying, the consistency is key. The one thing you should always do is if you ever get rejected, let them know the reason why they're rejecting you so that you can go and fix it. If they tell you, oh, you lack this, you know, there's a gap in your skill set, you don't have this skill set, then you can go online and look for a course that would fill that gap, do some, you know, work around, make sure you can find experience to intern so that you actually get, the, you know, the experience of the skill set because theory knowledge is different from actual practical knowledge. And once you have that, you can then reapply again. And then you can keep reasoning and repeating that process until you now realize, okay, you think, I think you filled all your skill set gaps until you are now actually, you land your first job. You might get 300 no's, but the first yes that you get, most likely you just become a yes moving forward, mm -hmm. right? And Hey, I don't want to do shameless plug, but let me do it anyway. Yeah. I wrote a book. The book is called Newbie to Techie. And the, the book sort of mm -hmm. articulates everything, like the journey from moving from a non, uh, someone who does not work in tech, who wants to transition into technology, whether you are a primary school student, secondary school student, graduate, or someone who already has a full-time job as a doctor or physician, but there's many success stories of people who have transitioned, right? They've come from, you know, being um, a physiotherapist or, you know, architects or estate managers, and they've all transitioned into tech, earning six-figure jobs in the abroad, some here working remotely, some have emigrated. And it's just because of this same strategy, right? It's just really about finding information, upskilling yourself, looking for the relevant experience, rinse and repeat. That's it.
Okay, I like what you've said. This is our book. I hope we have a soft coffee, or you're going to send us a coffee. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> it's on. It's on Amazon. So there's a physical copy. You can buy it in mm. uh, in Nigeria, but okay. then also it's on Amazon, right? Okay. Um, I can always send you the link of how to get Please it. Please so, do. No, no. Please do. Honestly, yes. we would love to have that. Go ahead with you. Um, I like this nice, concise strategy that you've put forward. Um, but I think that we also have a challenge locally, and I guess some of our viewers will be thinking that. Internships are not the easiest of things <laughs> to come across in our world, right? Um, mm. And then there's also the fact, like I hear you say, you know, apply, it may take you 300 applications and you'll get your first yes. But that transition, yes, there's some transferable skills, then there are things that you can obviously go and learn, like all the different things that you teach um, at Studiopedia. But the fact is, it still comes down to that experience. So if I'm struggling to find an internship locally, are there mm. any possibilities internationally as well? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. There are. There are opportunities internationally. Um, they, I'd say that sometimes they're not just publicly uh, available, but they are there. They're there. Um, I know uh, there was, I think there was a company, I think it was a student or so, that was locally trying to connect people to international internships. But even the international internships, to your point, are very scarce. So I was even at a meeting, was it not, uh, sometime last week, where I was talking about, oh, it was actually at the platform, where I was saying to companies that my charge to companies, how they can help is by also creating internship programs. One of the start early startups that I did, uh, Delivery Science, with my partner, Larry Oidotu, we did, that was how we were taking in, you know, young developers. So we'd, um, we'd sort of like, there was some sort of like, you know, known secrets uh, with the Yabate community and Yila community. Every time it was time for them to do their sewers, they knew that our company used to take interns. So we'll take interns, usually they were green, and we'll work with them for three to six months during that internship program. We'll sort of train them. What tend to happen is when they go back to school, when they graduate, they always want to come back and at least take their first uh, year or two with us because they know that this was their breeding ground for them to learn. And that's what kicked that kick started their their Very journey yes. i know it doesn't directly answer your question but if there are a lot more companies that did what we were doing right everybody's always looking for finished products that is shiny you know an employee who's already has all the skills but you know someone needs to start somewhere right and working with companies to get them to start internship programs i think is uh, something that we can do to sort of solve the internship scarcity and it's not a nigeria thing it's just a global thing mm -hmm. right to your point so uh one day at a time okay so chuka let's come back to the biggest elephant in the room yeah even though the people think that these unemployment numbers is largely related to young people it's not they are mm. people that are old they don't have jobs, you know, and they wish. So is there anything like age restrictions, you know, to these, you know, skills that one needs to think about? Because somebody might be in their 50s, Question. they don't have any job, and they're just looking, what can I do? You know, how can I begin to earn money? Mm -hmm. You know, is it too late for me, or can I start now? What exactly would you say to that person? Uh, I'd say that that is absolutely just not true. That's absolutely not true. So it depends on, but I'll say one thing, it does depend on the kind of role you want to, right? I feel at least culturally, right, in Nigeria, older people find it difficult working for much younger people, right? I'm not saying that there aren't people who do it. It's just a cultural thing. But if you don't have that cultural issue or that cultural bias, then the sky's the limit for you, right? I think... All you have to do, you can upskill yourself just like any other person. You have the same brain, you have the same skill set, you can learn just like everybody else. And once you've learned, you can get opportunities just like anybody else. The world in general, at least what from where I sit, how I've experienced it, I've seen older people who've gotten jobs at, you know, entry-level software development roles. But that's if you want to become a software developer. But if you want to be a CX person or you want to be a product manager or you want to be a project manager or you want to do design or you want to do graphics it doesn't matter what you want to do what matters is your skill set and your portfolio of work okay it doesn't matter that you are you know the technology is not ageist that's what i'm saying like it's just 
only the earlier point that I made in Nigeria, because it, it culturally, right, it's just a cultural thing. You don't so want to go into a company. If I came to you, Chuka, and I was 65 years old, I already gathered yeah. the skill. Would you employ me in your company? Why not? I will look. What I'm not looking at is your age. I'm looking at your portfolio of work. Am I capacity? What matters? Yes, it's the portfolio of your work. If you show me the things that you can do and that you've done, why would I not employ you? Hmm. Why would I not employ you? I see. It's just you would employ the best candidate for the role. Hmm. It's just quite simple, right? Who is the best candidate? Um, but in many instances, sometimes you might not even be employing one person. You might be employing quite a number of people. Hmm. It doesn't negate age. It's just a number. And the sooner we start seeing it that way, the better. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it would be great. I mean, I mean, absolutely, age is a number. Um, it would be great if a lot of people saw that because when you were talking about, yes, you would absolutely hire the person. I'm thinking a great many number of companies have policies that define what retirement age is. And um, for a lot of companies, 65 is a retired, like they're retired, not even just like <laughs> about to be retired, okay. right? Um, okay, so okay. It, let me let me let, let me let me interject. I'm sorry, I know you wanted to land it, but let me interject. There isn't a rule that says you must work for a company. Hmm. You can also freelance. There's freelancing. This is a whole world that I didn't even talk about. Hmm. All the world I've been talking about is exporting your skills to you know tech companies that are in you know Netherlands or in Amsterdam or Germany, wherever. But there's freelancing, there's sites like Upwork. There's sites, not even Upwork, there's sites like TopTal, Total, right? There is sites like Geekstar. There is sites like Fiverr. All these people are, all these companies are freelancing companies. So if you've learned how to do copywriting, copywriting is something that is needed quite in tech. What's copywriting? It's not even a tech role per se. It's a role. You see people do it. If you learn how to do copywriting, you can go to Fiverr, list your services. They don't, they, nobody cares how old you are. On top down, nobody cares how old you are. What matters, again, is your portfolio of work, right? I just wanted to call that out here. You don't necessarily have to do a nine-to-five job. You can also freelance. And I dare say you probably will make a lot more money freelancing than you would do in a nine-to-five job. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry I interjected, but I wanted to say <laughs> You want to continue? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you took out the legs from my question very elegantly, so well done. <laughs> but... um. <laughs> I think that you've sort of, um, you've, you've said enough to whet our appetites, right? And I'm mm -hmm. mindful that when we have these sort of conversations that we're really trying to, to you know, stick in that straw and just suck out as much knowledge as possible. Time <laughs> runs out. So um, yeah. I think I would like a paint by numbers, right? We've talked about the opportunities. We talked about, you know, you can go here, you can do this. For the person who's listening today who says, you know what, this all sounds very interesting. I want to work without geographical restrictions. And like I said, I want to earn dollar. Where, Thank you. Give us a paint by, by numbers. What should I do first? Where should I be looking? What? So we've, we've, we said the baseline, which is have an internet connection. But then the internet yep. is super vast. Like I could get lost in one Google search for a couple of hours and come out on the other side and still be like, huh? Um, mm -hmm. So, so. Just a couple of tips to say, you know what, this is what you should do first. This is what you should do, where you should go. Um, I mean, maybe you plug, you know, dot, dot, dot. But by the way, I studied, <laughs> I studied product management. So I did internship. <laughs> Let me come back to that. Go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, just to give something that our viewers can, you know, maybe just take notes. Quickly, and because on I have to. one more question before mm. we run out, run out of time. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, sorry, I'm trying to position my screen, make sure that lighting is good. It's already getting dark. It's fine. Okay. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, the first things first is, I'd say, Udemy.com. If you don't do, okay. even if you don't take anything away from this, uh, what the show you're watching, use Udemy.com. Now, Udemy.com is a platform where people like you and I, who have skill sets, who know, you know, maybe something, maybe they know software development or they know project management or product management or they know Scrum or what have you, have prepared courses and put it on there so that people like, you know, fresh entrants into technology who want to learn can then go there and pay, you know, a very small fee. Usually the courses are very, very affordable, anywhere between, say, 20 to 50 dollars all depending on what you want to learn now quite all right some of it some of the quality of the content might be entry level things but it's enough to whet your appetite mm -hmm. so that you can then go for the more advanced courses right if you want to go for the more advanced courses then you can then do something like udacity which then gives you actually a nano degree which is very helpful because it then strengthens the quality of your portfolio um so if anything 
right? Udemy sort of gives you access to thousands of courses, thousands of lessons, which kind of like get your um, um, get you going. The biggest question you have to ask yourself is, what do you want to do? Hmm. And I like I mentioned earlier in the show that is well dependent on many things about you, your personality type, your, you know, what you like to do, what you love to do. What really, you, you always want to value. Sure that. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, exactly. So those are the things that you have to watch out for. Now, again, shameless plug. I said I wrote mm-hmm. a book. So go to books.iamchuka.com. The name of the book is Newbie to Techie. I have itinerized everything there from beginning to end. I know the show is only taking parts of it, but it kind of works you through a journey of how you can start transitioning. I think most of all the questions that, you know, we may want to ask even beyond the show have been answered there, but I'm still here to take more questions. So one last question. Our daddy, Elon Musk, said uh, remote work is (laughs) a scam. (laughs) It was Elon Musk that said it that. (laughs) They say remote work is a scam because as it is now, they are beginning to see that come everybody fire back to office and don't do yeah. remote work and everything. How would this yeah. affect? <laughs> they don't want to hear that. They are scammers. So how would this how would this affect tech jobs, right? Especially for people that have gotten tech jobs, you know, like you know, I'm in Nigeria. I'm working for a company in Canada. Mm-hmm. So how would this if people start to go back? to the original structure of going to a physical location, how would this impact it? So first of all, my own opinion, I don't think we will ever really completely go back to return to office. That's the first thing. Elon Musk saying remote work is a scam, of course it's his opinion, but he's seeing the impact of remote work on his business. Mm. And it depends on the kind of business that you're running. For example, CX is going to be hard to do from home. You need to be in the contact center. Like, there's some roles that you should technically be around. And I'm not going to deny that there is a certain level of um, quick progress you make when you are in the office with your colleagues, right? There's nothing as good as the tap on the shoulder to say, hey, how about this? Help me unblock, so on and so forth. While all those are true, remote work is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. This is the new dispensation. I don't think it's going anywhere. The worst that will happen is that, Companies will then switch to like a hybrid, you know, situation where people go to the office once or twice a, 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 a day, week, a, yeah. sorry, twice a week, and then, you know, work from home. But working from home sort of is a new norm. I know how much companies sort of saved from clo- closing down a good chunk of their offices, you know, how much that affected their bottom line. Instead, they took some of the savings they do from office and gave their people work from home um, resources. So the, 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 the it depends on what side of the spectrum you stand. I think uh, there are benefits to working from home, and mm. then there are, you know, also obvious advantages to coming into the office. Mm. But I think where we probably will most likely settle and where the world is going is a hybrid situation, right? Mm. And what companies will start to do is they will have some roles that will be like, okay, this can be remote only, and then they'll have some other roles where they'll be like, oh no, at least ninety percent or eighty percent in office. Mm. That's where we're going as, ah, as, okay. as, as, as all a right. Project. So we we we'll watch out to see what will happen quickly. Let's read. Read just right. one more one comment. Go Let's ahead. take this comment. I mean, first and foremost, I'm happy to see this comment from the center. Yeah, so I, was Daniel, like, I, was thinking, I was thinking about him earlier in the show going, I mean, I just wonder what happened to him. So, <laughs> Daniel, we're excited to see your message again. Thank you for sending it in. And he says, good evening, my dear beautiful sisters. Of what are you saying? Hashtag ways, building skills that transcend geographical location. Your guest made mention of something very important. He said that you do not have to be an engineer to be involved in tech, and this is very true and key. He also said something about youth developing skills to improve the internet system. He gave an example of a site manager developing skills in the site with his own ideas. Someone who is skillful enough should partner with the government for support. Ua asked a question about age restrictions when it comes to getting jobs with a skillful person. And he must confess that we look irresistible today. I had to find time to put that in. Okay. God bless you too, Daniel. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Chuka. We are hoping that when you're in Nigeria, you can grace our set physically. Because yeah. we had a fantastic yeah. conversation. <laughs> this was really, really worth our time. It's a beautiful way to wrap the weekend. Thank you yeah. so much, Chuka, for being a fantastic guest. We are going My to look pleasure. for your book. Oh. Me, I will go find it because I want find money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so before we go, ensure sure you follow us across all our social media handles. You can interact with us further. Drop your comments, and more importantly, follow all our engagements on social media. Like, share, and invite your families and friends to watch and follow the conversation. Now, if you missed our quote for today, here it is again. 
skills open the doors to opportunities. They break every economic boundary and empower society to maximize their potential. Nothing else is that powerful. So if you, want, if you really want to change um, the status quo today, go and learn a new skill. And look for Chuka's book. It will help you out. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely evening.